Salesmasters, the hard knock school of everything new construction and remodeling, powered by Home Projects. Now introducing the Home Projects Housemasters, Steve and John with a three-part series, the top 15 home improvement myths. Now, part one, numbers 15 through 11. Welcome to Housemasters, presented by Home Projects. I'm Steve, and as always, I'm joined here with John. Before we get into the uh, 15 most common home improvement myths, we'd like you to subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow along with our podcast wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast hit like hits the star leave a comment share it with the world Uh, we'll go into a little bit more information at the end why that's important to us but uh, this is supposed to be an organic discussion with you the listeners and we're hoping that you will join John and I in the discussion if you hear something that we're about ready to say that you like or something that you challenge us on please Send us a note. If you don't want to do it via YouTube or in the podcast software, go to our website, homeprojects.com. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and last but not least, um, we ask that you make a donation to our cause if you're, if you're able to. Again, you go to our website. Uh, there's a donate button on the navigation at the top of the page. And you can use GoFundMe or PayPal and send us a donation if you're getting some value out of what it is we are doing here. And we hope you're getting some value out of this. So, John, we are here to talk about the top 15 um, common home improvement myths. And we are actually going to do a series of videos here, a three series, try the trifecta of home improvement myths, uh, five at a time. And uh, we'll, we'll publish these in order. So when we get to the end of this episode, hopefully YouTube or your podcasting software simply roll to the next video. Um, but this will allow us to, uh, to shorten the length of the videos a little bit and hopefully give you guys a chance to take a break in the middle. But we're going to go from 15 all the way down to 1 with the grand finale at the end. And uh, a grand finale it will be. Um, so John, you want to get us cranked off here? Um, First one, uh, the number 15 is small changes in the scope of work are easy and inexpensive. Number one, number, the top 15 starts with that one. Um, that's a biggie. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a biggie to a contractor. Yes. Um, it doesn't seem in the contractor homeowner relationship that it's as much of a biggie to a homeowner. And the reason be- the reason for that is the fact that they don't understand the process of how to plan a particular project correct and correct. why the trades are set chronologically the way they are and uh, why this is done before this is done and so on and so forth and what happens is, is you get into the process and you get moving along and you you get on somewhat of a rhythm and then all of a sudden homeowner comes home one afternoon from work and they say you know I don't like that wall there. Is there any way that we can move that wall back? It's, it's just a small it's, change. It's it's only 18 inches. <laughs> and it's like, you know, that 18 inches is going to cost you about 18 grand. Thousand dollars an inch. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 why? I don't understand. All it is is a wall. Um, well. I have to call off of uh, call off my sub that's coming tomorrow to put the floors in because now the wall's being moved. I have to call the framer back that's now on another job site uh, to reframe the wall, and now I, I'm also going to have to bring in my drywall sub to re-drywall the wall. And the second portion that you don't, as a homeowner, quite understand is the fact that. I now have to pay those subs twice Twice, because they're not going to give me a discount just by virtue of the fact that, you know, I gave them a two for one. They're going to charge me what they charge me normally for that particular project. So um, what ends up happening in, in this type of case? And, you know, there are obviously, you know, small small differences or small changes that are made. Like, you know, a painter comes in, paints the master bedroom. Um, coastal gray and 
it's like, well, Coastal Gray doesn't really look like the little uh, square I bought at Sherwin Williams or square I got at Sher- Sherwin Williams. Uh, can can we change the paint? Yeah, sure, we can change the paint. Not a big now, deal. That doesn't change the fact that I have to get the painter out there to paint a second time. He's going to charge me a second time. And it upsets the rhythm. But those things happen in the construction arena. Um, the thing that you have to understand is from a contractor's perspective, that's a change order. Okay. And any professional contractor worth his weight who does a change order is going to put everything in writing. They're going to put not only the uh, product or the service that was provided, but what these product or service is changing to and the specifications related to that new, um, that new change. Yep. And then what they're going to do is they're going to more than likely request payment on the spot. Yes, in advance, in full, no refunds. Advan- in advance, in full, and the reason for that is otherwise you could just pile up a bunch of change orders left and right. The job completion date keeps you know, inching out. He's having to put off his other clients after you, and he never ends up getting paid because you keep putting in change orders. So there's a reason, um, you know, it's easy from a from a trades perspective to be able to do these types of things a lot of times. Sometimes it's not. Most of the time it is. But it doesn't change the, the, uh, the idea that it, it, we have to completely upset the apple cart and start over from scratch. So... That's why it's a major myth and a big misnomer in the home improvement industry. Yeah, and further down the list there, there'll be another myth that feeds into this. But, um, uh, you know, what, is it, what do they say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Um, planning ahead and making sure mistakes like that don't happen is also, uh, you know, part of the plan too, if you can avoid that. Now, obviously, you get walls up, you get things up, you, you know, you can't see something until it's in, in, in real life. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute and things have to move. And, and, you know, if, if, if a change order for 10 grand to move the wall, 18 inches makes that space worth living in for the next 30 years, then that's a, that's a great investment. But you as the homeowner have to understand it's not a small change. Scope of work, um, does change. It has a cascading effect and it's not inexpensive. And let me also say real quick, Steve, before we go on to the next one. Yep. There's a lot of people, especially homeowners, because they're not in the arena every day, that don't have the gift of visioning things conceptually. Mm -hmm. You and I have that gift from the standpoint that we've been in homes our entire life. But there's even builders and remodelers that that can't conceptually see something until it's actually built in front of them. Um, That's just, you know, that's just certain brains work different ways. And we understand that. And that's why, you know, a change order in, a, in the process is, is an acceptable mode of, you know, I mean, of the process. Correct. Um, but you just have to understand that while it's acceptable, there are consequences that are attached behind it that you need to be understanding of. So. Absolutely. All right. On to number 14 of the most common home improvement myths. Speaking of expensive... The myth is more expensive is always better. And th- this, this can, it can be true, but more than likely more expensive does not mean always better. Um, elaborate on that. Before I elaborate, I also want to notate that this is going to somewhat contradict what we're going to go into next. Number 13. The- <laughs> Number 13, <laughs> but we'll explain that as we move along. Um, expensive being always better uh, is more geared to not necessarily the contractor, but usually the material that's being used on the job site. Correct. Um, let's say, for instance, um, let's uh, talk about bathroom finishes or kitchen finishes, uh, your, your faucets, say. You know, uh, a comp, a, you know, a faucet like a price sister or a, um, a Delta is going to be more expensive than, say, Hampton Bay at Home Depot. But the style of Hampton Bay 
might fit your needs better than the options that are available with Price Fister or Delta. Correct. Um, the sprayer might work differently, or you know, have a it might have a certain feature on the the type of uh, spray that comes out of the uh, the hand sprayer. Uh, it could be a number of different things. Um, take windows, for instance. Um, you've got a lot of uh, expensive windows out there. You know, your Andersons, your Pellas, your Marvins, Colby's. Um, gosh, I mean, there's a number of them out there. You know, those are all wood-clad products. Um, but there's some wood-clad products out there that don't put, <laughs> you know, millions of dollars in, in uh, marketing and advertising. Uh, and, you know, when they put those millions of dollars into marketing and advertising, just like the, the faucet names that we, we mentioned earlier. Price goes um, that, That's a cost of goods mm -hmm. that they have to profit off of. So, you know, uh, coming from the building material side of the business, like I did starting out in my career, um, there's a lot of non-known brand names out there that are just as good as the big names. Absolutely. Um, decking, you know, you got Trex. Everybody calls it Trex. Trex is kind of like the Kleenex of the tissue market, of the deck market. Um, you know, people don't say, hey, give me that box of puffs. Right. They say, give me a box of Kleenex. Right. Um, they do the same thing in the decking world, you know, with Trex. There's a lot of other products out there that are equally as good as Trex, if not better. Yeah, people say, so, I want Trex like. Well, exactly. Yeah, you know, becomes a noun turns into an adjective, and and there's a there's several other products out there that are actually better than Trex, in my opinion, that don't have the the price tag. They're easier to install. They're more um, uh, sustainable, better warranty, more colors, easier to work with, and cheaper, uh, frankly. So. Yeah, you know, often the brand becomes synonymous with the actual product that's being put down. Yeah. So in other words, trucks, trucks, what you said, becomes synonymous with composite decking. Yep. You know, um, so, you know, just just keep that in mind when you're when you're trying to budget for, you know, particular products. Uh, try to look at your needs first as opposed to your wants. And definitely don't try to keep up with the Joneses just because it has a you know, a, a brand attached to it. Um, in some cases, I mean, you know, a brand does mean something. It does. But it does. Research, I mean, yeah, I mean, you take, for instance, like a lock set. You know, Baldwin, <laughs> you can't go wrong with a Baldwin yep. lock set. The guts Impact, are good. You know, uh, Schlag, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's a number of them. Like Yale is another good one. Um, but, you know, just just make sure that you're you're putting your priorities in the right spot. So speaking of the right spot, number 13 on the list, as we alluded to prior, is a contradiction to number 14, and it is cheaper is always better. This is probably the biggest, the last five on the list, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, you know, the contradiction here is, you know, when we were speaking in, in the last uh, one, the more expensive is always better, that was geared more towards material cost usually this one cheaper is always better is geared more towards the contractor that Service you're hiring. Provider. Yep. okay it's interesting it's an interesting dynamic that people always want to keep up with the joneses when it comes to tangible products um but they don't want to keep up with the joneses when it comes to being intelligent with the contractor that they hire um we had a previous episode that we were talk where we were talking about um you know somebody getting three bids yep and one of the contractors was twenty thousand dollars another was twenty two thousand dollars and the other one came in at twelve five there's actually a large element of the population that would go and hire that twelve five contractor not understanding the fact that at the end of the job, if the end of the job ever gets there, you might end up paying two and three times that twelve five, when you could have just paid twenty or twenty two and been done with it yep. and been properly protected with a warranty in lieu of a taillight warranty that uh, Buck and his truck gave you at twelve five. So, you know, uh, it, it, part part of what. 
our value is at, at home at our house masters is we want to to create an understanding on both sides of the equation here obviously we're trying to you know raise the professional level of the contractor side but we're also in the same breath trying to raise the knowledge level of the homeowner side and allow you as a homeowner to understand what goes into the costs of a particular project. If you see in a situation like that, 2022 and 12, five, somebody's missed something. Yeah. And it's not the 20 and the 22 guy. They've missed either insurance. They don't, that they don't have, they missed a week's worth of labor that they didn't account for. They mismeasured their product. Um, and I will even go so far as to say that it could have been intentional. Mm -hmm. A Absolutely. lot of these low bids that you see that are drastically lower than the rest of the market are done on purpose to get you under contract so they can turn around and do a change order. What ends up happening is, is on a Friday afternoon, they come to you and say, Mrs. Jones, you know, we just found out that we missed 14 squares of uh, decking and we, we mismeasured the, the product. So we need more money. Well, you know, then you're in between a rock and a hard place. You've got a half half of the deck built. You're pregnant. Um, you know, the, the, the composite decking that you bought was bought with a specific lot number attached to it. Um, if you hire another contractor, he might buy from another supplier, which buys it from another distributor. And it's a completely different lot number, but it's the same color. But it's still not going to match when it gets on the job site. So you have a, a number of different challenges in a situation like that. And a lot of these jack legs understand that they, those are challenges and they're putting you in between a rock and a hard place. They're leveraging so, that. Again, I'm sorry, Steve. They're, they're, leveraging, your misunder they're leveraging their ability your to ignorance. change order you up. Yes, they're leveraging your ignorance. Yes. Um, so, and, and that's not always the case. I'm just telling you that there are contractors out there that, that, that will do that. And you got to watch out for it. But... You know, it, I'm not a big proponent of, you know, getting three bids for everything. I think that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, I've always lived by the the notion that, you know, if, if a contractor comes in my home, I'm able to develop a decent relationship with him. I can tell right off the bat that he and I, can, we communicate well. We're speaking on the same level. Uh, and he's providing a service that matches or exceeds what I'm actually seeking. I'm going to hire the guy. You know, if this price is reasonable, I'm going to hire the guy. I don't need two other people to keep him honest. No, you're actually right. And, I, and I, at this point in time, I'd, I'd reference a, a video we've already um, published uh, about contracts. And uh, we, we actually went into a bit about that. I encourage our listeners, our viewers, to go check out the uh, contra uh, Contracts for Homeowners 101 series. Um, where we talk a bit about that and how the contract that you agree to um, could impact um, the cost of the work and how honest your contractor will be with you uh, on those. And you can avoid this myth that cheapest is always better. Yeah. Um, number 12. So this is uh, a, <laughs> this, this is a goodie. Um, everyone's, everyone has a TV in their room and they all love, they all watch, love sitting down and watching, uh, HGTV. Um, and this pertains to that. So number 12 is remodeling projects can be completed inside of 30 minutes. The magic 30 minute episode. It's actually probably more like 20 minutes after you factor in commercials, John. Um, yeah, actually it is. <laughs> and, um, there's, there are no, uh, hiccups on the job site. Nope. There, everybody who's on a job. Uh, at the time they're scheduled to be yep um, at seven o'clock in the morning yep um, there's no snafus when it comes to you know different um, you know product choices or sizes or anything like that dick uh, everything is just a okay 100 percent perfect and um, these particular shows while they have value in terms of creating ideas uh, from a from a design standpoint, from a color uh, palette standpoint, from a number of different arenas in the in the construction business, um, they've done a major disservice to the industry because what they've done is they've created a scenario where 
the contractor is up against a clock and they shouldn't be. Right. They should go their own pace at the pace that's going to provide a, perf a perfect product at the end of the job. And um, I don't know how many times, you know, homeowners said, well, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I need you in here on Thursday and it needs to be done by Monday and you can't work on the weekends. And you can't start before nine and you have to be gone by four. Yeah, either that or you can't be in the house when I, when nobody's at the house. You have right. to work at night. Right. I've gotten that too. Um, so, no, these projects, they last what they last. If you're in a full remodel where you're getting um, electrical and plumbing and HVAC and those types of things uh, you have inspections. altered in your home, uh, that adds time to the project because you're dealing with inspections. Um, you know, uh, you might deal with the actual failure of an inspe inspection, or you might deal with a pain in the rear end inspector from your county or city. Um, there's a number of different things that go awry in a remodeling project that you just need to be aware of. So, and I'll also extend this. Um, you know, we're alluding to television here, HGTV, and all. You know, Discovery Channel has several of these too. I also applies to um, social media. Insta, you know, Instagram, um, Facebook, House is a big one where people post these pictures of the before and after of a, a project with no explanation of the pure hell they went through between those two photographs. Um, so you need to, um, you know, be aware that, you know, the camera can hide a lot of things. <clears throat> All right. And then um, the last one in this series is number 11 of 15. And John, you're going to have to explain this one a little bit more because uh, we've actually touched on this in other episodes. But the myth is my house needs to breathe. I need, I need my house to breathe, to, to puff. It needs to ventilate. Um, to a certain extent, that's true, but not to the extent that most people think. Most people think that you have to huff and that house needs to huff and puff and blow itself over. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, the difference in what we're talking about here is an uncontrollable breath where the house is ventilating uncontrollably through penetrations and gaps and crevices and everything else that are just present just by virtue of the way a house is constructed and the way a house has settled over the years versus providing a controlled ventilation system that works in unison with your HVAC system to controllably ventilate the house and allow it to breathe. Correct. So we want a minimum breath of that house, but the breath that we want needs to be controllable to make it so it can be the most healthy home to stay to, to live in as well as the most energy efficient home to live in. Yeah. So there's are two completely different schools of thought there. The old school of thought was, yeah, it needs to breathe like a, a, a split rail fence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's not the case. Um, and, and, and the changes in, in thought of really, it's only been the last 15 to 20 years yeah. really where that, that, dichotomy has changed uh big time and a lot fact, of it's gone 180 degrees from what it used to be a lot of that has to do with building code um indoor air quality is a you know as the green movement has evolved in this country and has shown up in the international building code um building sciences uh have impacted the, the indoor air quality codes and uh and modern air conditioning systems are required to have, provide makeup air that's a that's a technical term that homeowners should know and understand, especially if they're going to replace um, a HVAC system. Makeup air is air that's brought in intentionally, brought into the house, heated and cooled, and used to supplement airflow inside the home. So that as your air in your house circulates, it's replacing that air with fresh air. That's the makeup air it's using. And then if you have an ex a exhaust hood. A lot of homes now have these enormous exhaust hoods over their ranges for exhaust and cooking fumes. And that is putting a constant negative pressure in your house. When you turn that fan on, it's just like the exhaust fan in your bathroom. It blows air outside. Well, that inherently takes air out of the house 
and puts it under negative pressure. Well, guess where the house is going to try to make that air up from the outside? It's going to try to suck it in through those cracks and crevices that you mentioned. So um, fume hoods are generally des are designed to bring in their own air. Again, make up air or fresh air. Uh, that are usually not conditioned in that case. But um, those are all mechanized systems with science behind them, building science to make sure your hair, your, the, house, your, the air in your house is healthy. Um, reduces mold and mildew, which are the same thing. Um, airborne contaminants um, has a function of how, what your, where your air filters are. But your house does need to breathe. It just has to be engineered to breathe correctly. Is that good enough? I believe you. Okay. I believe you, man. <laughs> All right, preach, so preach, brother. Preach, brother. Um, so we uh, we're going to take a, a break here uh, at the end of this this top five here, and we're going to terminate this video and hopefully roll you into the next one. But if you're not sticking around for the um, next five myths in the series, uh, we ask that you like this video, subscribe to our channel. If you're on podcast, please give us a comment. Uh, subscribe to that as well. Again, hit us up on socials if you got any questions or if there's any other myths you would like to, us to discuss. Um, this is all a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's also serious at the same time. So uh, hopefully we'll see you in just a couple of minutes. If not, um, look for you on next time. Thank you. Peace. Home Projects House Masters continues with top 15 home improvement myths, part two, numbers 10 through 6. Welcome back to House Masters, presented by Home Projects. I'm still Steve. John is still here and we are still talking about the top 15 home improvement myths and we're getting ready to talk about number 10 through number six ratcheting up the excitement as we work towards number one as always we ask you to subscribe to our channel like our videos share with your friends if you see what, if you like what you're seeing please share us on social media more importantly if you have any questions or comments or any ideas for future myths please put them in the comments or visit our website and send us an email it's supposed to be an organic discussion and we hope that you participate so john number 10 is this where i get to talk all week we know that you're going to <laughs> um but, but before you do do these does this series of episodes somehow make you feel like casey Kasem? <laughs> Yeah, like I'm counting down the top 15 songs in America or something yeah, like that. Yeah, like every Saturday morning. Yeah, you listen and you, and you record it so you have your favorite songs on a, on a, on a yeah. recorded tape. I, I, it almost makes me want to do a, um, you know, a, a, what was it? You have those people call in or email and, and they wanted to dedicate a song. Well, you I wanna... almost want to dedicate one of these particular uh myths to you and well, I, think, I mean it's a perfect time for it i, I was going to so say yeah i dedicate I, this one to you i think number 10 is probably a perfect one to dedicate to me why don't you go ahead and read it so there's no bias here and then i'll i'll just take over from there all right well i can do that for you um if i could even find it um <laughs> architects and interior designers are a complete waste of money <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed so, that so we. So now is the time that you must justify and redeem yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed we even have this on the list. I guess, I guess I'm happy that we're in the top third of the of the least surprising. Well, technically speaking, you're actually in the bottom half. Because, oh, uh, you'd have to be actually towards the bottom of this list. Okay, uh, six. So, so, ar um, so architects and interiors designers are a waste of money. So, um, obviously, I'm an architect. Um, I'm a licensed architect, state of North Carolina, have been for going on 15 years. <clears throat> and when I was in practice, I specialized in uh, high-end residential, um, uh, adapt historic uh, adaptive reuse, and some commercial work. Um, and... I competed with, in my market, in North Carolina, you're not required to be a licensed architect to do residential design. So in our market here in North Carolina, I competed with um, unlicensed draftsmen and designers who had every right to be in the market. Um, I can't say that they weren't good at what they did. A lot of them were very talented. But they're just, um, they had uh, a lower standard of ethical responsibility. 
Um, they did not carry insurance, um, errors and emissions insurance. It certainly didn't have the overhead I do when it comes to uh, maintaining my license, continuing education, um, the professional organizations that I belong to, like the American Institute of Architect and NCARB, um, which are all organizations that manage my license. And, I'm, and I say me, I'm talking me a lot here. That also goes for licensed interior designers, uh, engineers, um, physical engineers, PEs, civil engineers, landscape architects, anybody who has a degree and extensive amount of um, expertise in an industry um, brings a lot of value to the project. Now our fees are always gonna be a little bit higher compared to unlicensed designers and for all the reasons I just rattled off. But um, let's also take a step back here just from the, 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 co the pure cost of the architect or the interior designer. Let's talk more about the design process in general. Um, I'll sit here and I'll admit that there are a lot of residential designers or, or, uh, or uh, non-licensed designers out there who do a good job. And really the point here is that as a homeowner or contractors, if you're in design build, hiring a professional designer um, is never a waste of money. We we're talking earlier about moving the wall over 18 inches um, and how that um, you know costs money. Well, um, in my practice, I used a lot of 3D modeling um, uh, that allows you to see the space in as close to real time as possible. And the software I've been using has evolved over time. We can put um, you know, VR glasses on now and stand in a room. Um, those types of tools are, um, are very valuable. Um, they are expensive, but they bring a great value to the project for allowing you to see those spaces and being able to put furniture in a room, see how the sunlight comes through a window um, and, and, and model those types of things. And, and the other thing that's not, I, I don't know, John is, I think we actually do, we do get around to talking about building co or, or permits here eventually, but um, usually if you have a licensed architect and interior designer, you're gonna have high quality drawings um, that can be part of the deliverable into your project. In one of our previous episodes where we talk about contracts, we talk about the quality of deliverables and what the quality of deliverables does for the quality of the bid or the contract that your contractor comes to you with. And so um, if you are doing a significant project, if you're doing a, any, you know, anything um, that revol involves moving walls, um, changing mechanical systems, changing lighting, um, that deserves professional design. Um, and uh, it doesn't deserve a contractor sketching stuff out on a napkin and saying, what do you think of this? It, deser it deserves you as the homeowner sitting down with somebody and going through the design process, making mistakes on paper. I always tell people that, you know, the erasing a line in the computer is free. Um, erasing a line in the field costs you money. That's where that wall gets moved over 18 inches. So if you can make those mistakes in a computer, you're going to be far better off for it. And of course, we're kind of, I'm, the, the insinuation here is that we're talking about smaller projects, but um, the bigger the project gets, when you start getting into additions and significant renovations and new home construction or additions, you know, um, tying into existing structures, tying into existing systems, making sure that um, site work is correct. You don't introduce, um, uh, you know, stormwater issues or, or grading problems outside. Your roof lines don't conflict with each other. John, you, you and I have worked on a couple projects where the roof lines were just like, you know, missing in, <laughs> missing in the middle of the night and it took a hat trick to figure them out. Um, and, uh, you know, you just need somebody who knows what they're looking at and can envision the space. So um, it is a myth. Architects, interior designers, any professional designer is not a waste of money. They bring a lot of value to the table. And, um, and that's really what um, having professionals in the project are all about. And real quick, you know, going back to the um, scenario that we talked about in the last uh, episode in regards to moving the wall to 18 inches and the cost that that included, you, you take on a remodel, say, and I, you know, I'm not just gonna pinpoint a certain size remodel, but say your, your fee for being an architect on a project is $10,000. Mm -hmm. and a professional designer's price for being on that project is five. Well, that 5,000 and then some is saved just by virtue of going with the architect versus the designer. 
when it comes to a minor change like changing a wall in a remodel. So take that into account. You're going to end up paying it now or you're going to pay it later. Yeah. Better off that you pay it up front and get all of those things out in the open proactively so you don't have those issues on the job site during the process. But um, do you have anything else to add? Well, I, yeah, you actually brought something out that I do want to talk about. We, God, one I thought of, we were clear. In one of our previous episodes, we talked about contracts again. We referenced, we're referencing that episode a lot here. Um, and we talked about the design build process. And I think uh, if and when you're looking for an architect or interior designer, um, t- consider hiring somebody who has some construction expertise. Um, yeah, I'm a contractor as well, licensed contractor. There's not a lot of, of Steve Johnsons in the world that do architecture and construction, but you don't have to be a general contractor to understand how things go together. Uh, experience is, is valid. So hire somebody who knows the difference between a two by four and a two by six and the difference between a nominal and an actual measurement and uh, you know, uh, understands what makeup air is and, and indoor air quality and isn't just putting lines on paper or making things look pretty. So um, that's just a little plug for the professional designers all, all out there. So um, we were talked a lot about value of architects. So that kind of leads us into number nine on our list. Um, and that is my home improvement project just added value to my home. And when I just thought that we were never going to get here, here we are. We're going to talk about it. (laughs) Um, Everybody, I I was sitting there watching a commercial today for a uh, well-known window manufacturer who is just pounding the air right now um, because it's window season. Yep. Um, first thing they say in their commercial is about how their windows add value to the house. It adds value or it actually lessens the value of your bank account. That's what it does. First of all, second of all, um, remodeling magazine, I think it is every year has what they call a cost of value report. And what that means is, the cost of a project versus the value that you that you gain from having that particular project done in your home and there's not a project on the list that is a one-for-one proposition in fact your most return is roughly about 82 83 percent and that changes from project uh, comparing on t- trends on a yearly basis, uh, you know, windows, I mean, it's down in the 55% range. Yep. So every dollar that you spend on a window project, you're getting back roughly 55%. Okay. You have projects out there that will actually devalue your home. Yeah. A pool. Uh, a pool is a prime example. I mean, especially in above ground. But if you put an in-ground pool in certain jurisdictions, you know, the appraisers in that jurisdiction might look at that pool as being a liability. Homeowners, when you when you put the house up for sale, a lot of times will look at a pool as not only a liability uh, from, you know, a standpoint of safety, but also a liability from the standpoint of cost mm-hmm. in terms of maintaining that pool. It's expensive to maintain a pool. Um so don't don't live by this mantra that everything that you're going to do to the house automatically your house value just went up five grand because you did it that's not the case at all in fact we'll talk just speaking windows again real quick because they're really easy to talk about you know in most cases for one the real estate agent when they're selling a house you're not going to realize the value of your home until you actually sell the house okay you're going to pay on it through pay, through your taxes, you know, every year or however your uh, however your jurisdiction is set up when it comes to property taxes. But you're not going to realize the true value on your house or the uh, the depreciation uh, the appreciation of that house until you sell it or the depreciation in in some particular markets. Yep. Um, there's some appraisers that don't account for vinyl windows versus wood windows. 
Um, there's not a true model out there that's a set state. I mean, there's standards out there, but there's a lot of wiggle room around those standards. And the real estate agent, damn sure ain't going to talk about vinyl windows versus the wood no. or vinyl clad versus a vinyl, uh, vinyl window. They don't talk about those types of things. They just so, say they have, it has new windows is all you get out of it. Yes. And new windows doesn't add any particular set value to a house on the appraisal sheet. So, you know, just keep all these things in mind um, when you're doing this. Don't do it from a value standpoint. Do it from a need standpoint within the house and the utility of how your house works. Or, you know, if you got some money laying around and you want the extra convenience and you want that, you know, um, that garden tub, you know, go ahead and put it in. Um, but don't think that you're going to uh, get an extra two grand right. of value because you put a garden tub in your master bathroom. You need to do it for you. Um, I tell yeah. people, I tell clients all the time, design the house for you. Um, when I hear them start talking about what's the best design decision for resale, you know, what does the next owner think about it? I'm like, um, no, that's that's the that's the wrong reason to be thinking about this. Um, if you're if you're designing for the future for someone you don't even know yet, um, you're basically designing a spec home. So design for you, design what you like. Be aware of fads. Um, Ninety nine percent of interior design decisions made in kitchen flips and bathroom flips are based on current fads and current trends. Um, uh, the average uh, homeowner who owns their house for thirty years will renovate it twice. Um, and they're usually focusing on kitchens and bathrooms. Um, and it's usually based around um, significant point, uh, changes in their lifestyle, um, uh, kids growing up, leaving for college, or, 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 and or having, uh, having new, ch new children brought into the home. And so it's more driven by function, not uh, aesthetic. Um, I will also take this time to say that there is one thing you can do to a house that will actually add value to it. And that's actually adding on to the house. If you're physically adding square footage to the home, tangible square footage, that square footage has a value. Um, you know, in some markets, it might be $150 a square foot or $200 a square foot. Um, and so when you go to appraise your house um, for the next tax season, um, the tax collectors will say, okay, you added 100 square feet to your house. It's worth $200 a square foot. So now we're going to add the value of your home and you get to pay taxes on it. But um, that also uh, will account for when you go to resell the house, your house is being larger. Um, uh, and, and just before we move on to the next one, um, I will say that be careful about buying home renovations and additions by the square foot. If you're, do, if you're, if you're pricing a renovation or an addition by the square foot, you are not adding value to your house. Um, the only only projects that should really be priced by square foot is, is a new home construction. And even then, that's sketchy. That's, John, that's probably an episode, a whole episode unto itself. Um, anything you'd like to say before we move on to your favorite one here, number eight? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No. This is one. This is a fun one. Oh, uh, yeah. So number eight. HOAs and ARCs are always the spawn of the devil. Always the spawn of the devil. Um, well, speaking from the perspective of two former presidents of the same HOA. <laughs> yes, we believe that or not, people. John and I have been the have been the president of the same HOA for the same neighborhood. For the same neighborhood, not obviously at the same time, but yes, we've had the pleasure of working with the same developer. Yeah. Um, yeah. HOAs and ARCs, they have terrible names <laughs> or terrible reputations. And for some reason, I mean, you know, for in some actual occasions, rightfully so. Um, I've lived in neighborhoods before where, you know, the president of the HOA is, you know, the spawn of Benito Mussolini. Um, they're totalitarian. They are, uh, they're power hungry. They're, you know, everything that they should not be. But 
there are HOAs and ARCs out there. And our, what an ARC is, if we didn't list it, is an architectural review committee. Yeah, it's usually okay. a part of the HOA. Yes. Um, there are HOAs out there that do it the right way, that are working in the true spirit of what an HOA is supposed to be, which is keep the value of the neighborhood up to par. Correct. Protect your investment. Protect the investment of the actual members of that HOA. Um, obviously, you have issues with developers and you have issues with, you know, certain homeowners and, you know, this homeowner likes to keep six cars on ramps in the middle of his grass and, you know, um, they're just flamingos. a royal pain in the rear end to work with. What was that? Pink flamingos. Yeah, pink flamingos. Um you got a number of different uh, scenarios out there that an HOA will run into. Um, I was on Nextdoor last night, and somebody had posted, I don't know if you saw this, Steve, somebody in their neighborhood, the, the HOA president was driving down the street in a white sedan slowly. <laughs> okay? Well, the lady didn't know it was the HOA president at the time, but being that crime is at an all time high right now, um, she instantly looked at it as why is that car driving two miles per hour on idle down the street, you know, checking out all the houses. Well, what it turned out was she chased down the car and it happened to be the HOA president and he was checking on, um, violations in the neighborhood. That's not the spirit of what I, no. Ran my HOA. You don't go hunting for them. No. Um, that's the type of HOA that you want to get away from. And that's the type of HOA that it gives the good ones a bad name. Correct. If your HOA is meeting monthly or quarterly and inviting you know the members to come and discuss certain issues, whether it be neighborhood watch issues from a safety standpoint, whether it be you know, questions in regards to projects that they have coming up, whether it might be, you know, or do we want to add uh, certain social aspects to uh, the clubhouse, you know, so we can start breeding some camaraderie in the neighborhood. Those are the things that a HOA are meant to do. And there are a lot of them out there that actually do those things and they do them very well. Um, you know, it's, but, you know, <laughs> The, the problem with a lot of them is that the people that are on the HOA boards have never once had an ounce of power or authority in their life. And now they've got it. It's an unpaid uh, position. They were elected there. So it, in <laughs> some sense, it's a po you know, it's a politician type position or a popularity popularity contest. contest. Yeah. Or in some um, cases, whoever, the, the only person who volunteers gets the job. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there's a number of different dynamics and you have to, if you're moving into a neighborhood, uh, it, you would be extremely wise to drive down the street on idle <laughs> one day on a Saturday and just pull off on the side of the road and talk to a number of neighbors to see what their HOA is like if they're actually in one. Yeah. And they'll tell you. I mean, I'm telling you, a homeowner that doesn't like their HOA, they'll let you they know. Shout at the at the top of their lungs about how they hate them. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, in terms of arcs, real quick, that arc is the uh, only thing that saves you from uh, somebody having a yellow door uh, on a uh, tan house. So, um, and the value of the arc only comes from how strict the covenants are in terms of what they allow on a house or in a yard. Not necessarily how strict, but how detailed they are. So in other words, fences. Um, I was called by somebody on the present board in our neighborhood when I was in the airport a couple of weeks ago, and she said, hey, you know, what do you think about split rails? I said, well, I think they're nice. I mean, I've had a split rail in my yard before. Well, I'm, I'm, if somebody's wanting one in the back of the neighborhood, you know, should we allow it? It's like, for one, I'm not on the board anymore. That's a decision you need to make. 
and I said, furthermore, I said, it's not in the covenants. Right. There's nothing in the covenants about a split rail fence. Good or bad. Good or bad. Yeah. So what I'm saying is the value of the ark is actually having something in the covenants about a split rail fence. Teeth. Yay or nay, whether you're going to allow it or not. And that's the, and it could be good or bad. You know, I don't know. That comes down to opinion. But but that's also the value of actually getting on the board or getting on the ark yourself and having some actual control over those actual decisions. You can't sit back, not participate in any of this stuff, never go to the meetings or anything and sit back in the back fishing and complaining all the time. So, and there's a lot of that goes There's on a lot too. of that going on, yeah. Um, but all in all, you know, HOAs can be a good thing if they're in the right spirit. Yeah. But they can also be your biggest nightmare. In, in the neighborhood I live in now, um, John and I no longer live in the same neighborhood, so we can't we can't be on the same board now anymore. But, yeah, but um, I drove him away. <laughs> uh, in my neighborhood, we have a couple stormwater devices, uh, ponds um, for the layman, and uh, and we have privately owned roads and um, street lighting, as well as sidewalks. And so all of those entities are managed by our HOA. Um, a good chunk of our annual dues go towards the maintenance of those devices. And we also have a professional management company that our board has hired to manage those things. So although we have, uh, we have a lot of really smart people in our neighborhood, a lot of engineers uh, and business people in my neighborhood. So there's a lot of talent on our board and that talent suggested, hey, we should have a professional management company and, and we do. And they're responsible for the day-to-day the -day operations of, of managing those entities. But more importantly, they're also responsible for um, managing uh, uh, you know, issues between homeowners. Um, if, if someone does violate uh, the ARC or a covenant in the neighborhood, you know, barking dogs or um, you know, cars that shouldn't be where they are or crime or something, uh, sometimes that, that, that can be a tricky situation, an adversarial situation between two homeowners. And, the bo and a board member can call in the management and say, hey, we need you to, to, to na navigate this for us. And that, that brings a lot of value. So um, anything you want to add before we move on to number seven, which is also another no. big one that I'm going to take offense to? <laughs> no, I, I, there's partial offense that I take to it. <laughs> So uh, without more further ado, so number seven on our list is um, a contractor will always screw you. Now, the reason why I said I partially take offense is the fact that I, could, I voluntarily stepped away from actually being a contractor. So um, as did I. Know, I, I, I got it out of my blood. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're still in the... Uh, in the fray, Steve. I am. Um, so there are a lot of very good professional contractors out there that are in business for the right reasons. They employ good people that work for them. I had some of the best employees. I had, you know, for a construction business like I ran, I had no turnover. You know, when I hired somebody, I was extremely picky with who I hired. I interviewed probably to a fault to get the right person, and I paid well. And, I, I mean, at one time, I didn't have anybody on my entire construction crew in the field that had that were with me less than three years. That's unheard of. That's, all, that's incredible, yeah. Especially uh, in the trades. I mean, I mean, we talked in a previous episode about, you know, a lot of, in, in this business, man, I mean, a lot of these guys, especially the, the uh, low end of the totem pole laborers, you pay them on Friday and they don't show up on Monday, yep. you know? So if you're, if you're doing things the right way and for the right reasons, you know, your employees will pay you back with loyalty and that's going to only provide an ultimate top-notch service to the homeowner that you're trying to serve. There's a lot of contractors out there that, that meet every, or they check every box in terms of what it means to be professional, what it means to follow up, what it means to communicate, what it means to, you know, build a sound, professional, and moral business. But you have a large element 
in this industry also that because and i'm going to say this and i know i'm going to get myself in trouble um i'm constantly in trouble for my mouth but they they're not educated you're dealing with some of the and when i when i'm when i say this i'm speaking in terms of percentages now okay a large percentage of the construction industry you're dealing with the lowest of the doldrums when it comes to a value of a person you're dealing with your alcoholics your drug addicts your your you know your wife beaters your you know uh husband beaters you're being you know everything that you don't want to be you're dealing with on a job site and i'm telling you man i mean <laughs> I, I there were some people that i had as subcontractors man it's like you know, I don't know if I want that guy in the house. Now, granted, he was a subcontractor. I didn't have but so much control over that. But just by virtue of the way he looked, mm -hmm. didn't provide the professionality that I was actually seeking uh, or what I was trying to offer my homeowner. Um, but, yeah, you've got some real jack legs out there that, you know, they don't have the skill set. They don't have the education. Um, they have a very... Uh, a difficult time um, getting along with society in terms of how to navigate a uh, level of communication with a homeowner. Um, you know, uh, you, you got to be careful. But, you know, as with anything, uh, you know, it's anytime a sentence says will always or will never usually false correct okay because there's always going to be elements on both sides of the fence um i would venture to say that uh there's a good 30 to 35 percent of contractors out there that are wholesome good moral people and they're in it for the right reasons and i would venture to say steve that you agree with me i would um you know there's a there's a joke on the street that 99 percent of contractors make the other one percent look bad um, so, uh, yeah, um, and where I'm going to go with my comment here is don't hire a contractor only on price. Um, if you're worried about being taken advantage of, make sure you're hiring someone you trust and have a relationship with. And of course you can still get, you can still make a mistake and hire the wrong person, even though you like them or trust them. But, um, if you, if you have a relationship with them, then um, that will go a long way. And you know, my, we have a running joke in our house that you know, always bring someone into the house and see how the dogs react around them. Um, if the dogs don't like them, then kick them out. You know, um, that's there's a lot of truth. To a that. lot of truth. To that. A lot of truth to that. If if you know if 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 you don't if you get the the willies around somebody if they if they if they apparently don't have similar lifestyles and um, ethics and and uh and uh, uh you know a perception of, of how they present themselves as you do then you're probably not gonna get along with them very well um you know i wouldn't say don't hire somebody if you're a ford guy don't not hire them because they're driving a dodge but if they show up and they're and and they as you mentioned before there's alcohol or or other issues with them you'll know that real quick um and the fact that they even showed up to your house in that condition is, is a clue right there um, now, obviously, as, as the bigger the projects get, the more sophisticated and professional the contractors are that are responding to your, your request for work, you're going to work your way out of that. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of unlicensed trades out there that have all the characteristics that John just described. So, again, we've done a couple episodes already about contracts um, that talk a lot about how to weed these out. Um, and we've also talked about, um, uh, you know, the ethics of how to hire people. So um, a contractor won't always screw you, but it is possible to get screwed by a contractor. How about that? There are professional contractors that they're not going to intentionally screw you, but you at the end of the project might deem that you got screwed by them. That's correct. Yep. Just by virtue of a misunderstanding. Yep. Absolutely. And that's kind of... That That's probably happens of more often than not. Why we're doing what we're doing as in this podcast that we do, and, you know, with home projects is the fact that we're trying to create understanding of each other from both sides of the table. 
And there, there's been a major disconnect over the past decades in this industry. I mean, major, major disconnect. And we realize it. I mean, heck, we, we, we lived it. Um, you know, you don't live it so much, Steve, because you're more on the commercial side now. But in the residential side, man, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a it's a match of egos. Of course. You know? And, um, you know, it's it, it, this homeowner is braced. I mean, they hate you before you even knock on the door if you're a contractor. Just by virtue of this particular myth right here that we're talking about. Yeah. Because they've been conditioned to think that, man, this guy, when he comes in this house, he's going to screw me to high heaven. Yep. And that's just not the case. You just need to do your due diligence, do your homework, research, watch these these podcasts that we're talking about that we're going to navigate you through the process and uh you're going to be perfectly fine but that does not mean that there's not going to be something that goes awry in the middle of the process it happens it's called construction yeah and that's another major thing that we say in the in the industry it's construction <laughs> something on the job is going to happen snafu we promise you. situation normal all it's after. not if it's going to happen it's a matter of when yep I will, um, uh, yeah, all that's correct. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add to it other than the fact that, um, again, interview, interview. I always, on, when I was on doing design build work and clients always asked me about interviewing contractors, they, of course, always asked me for, for referrals and I, I would make referrals to contractors I had relationships with. But um, I always told them, I said, you know, everyone asks to talk to, you know, they're asked the contractor to give them referrals. You know, let me talk to your last three clients. Well, guess what? They're going to give you the names of the clients that are happy with them. So I challenge you as a homeowner to ask them for th two clients that went terrible. And, and make sure you tell the, con the, our, the contractor, you're not going to rely on those people's um, uh, input to make your decision. But it does two or three things for you. One, it, it, it will help you determine whether or not the contractor is honest and, um, and confident in himself or herself to give you the name of somebody that he knows is going to say bad things about him. Two, if you, get, if you actually do get a chance to talk to somebody who has nothing but bad things to say, it gives you an opportunity to ask how that went sideways. Um, and it can, you can learn a lot about a contractor. Was it communication? Was it a bad contract? Um, or was it that they showed up drunk and inebriated on the job site? There's a big difference between the two. One of one you can fix, the other other you can't. Um, say the other thing it's going to do, Steve, not to mean to step on you, yep. but it's going to show you as to whether that particular contractor has a specific level of skill set when it comes to crisis management. Correct, yes, that was my when, third one. When the crap hits the fan. <laughs> How do they deal with it? And and we just said minutes ago, it's going to hit the fan sooner or later. How do they deal with it? Were they calm and collective and provided solutions to get you out of the malaise that you're in? Or did it just end up just spiraling downward from the, from the point that that crap hit the fan? Yeah. Well, we beat that one to death. Yes. So, um, so number six and the last one in this, in this series of five, uh, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to explain the intent of it. And then I'll let you, John, um, commentate on it. So number six is building permits are just another form of government overreach and serves no purpose. So what we're talking about here in terms of building permits, of course, is building code. So the intent of a permit. I'll just, I'll just lay this out. The intent of the permit is to make sure that you as the homeowner are being protected and making sure that your project is being built per building code. Now, building codes are intended to do one thing, to protect the life safety of the occupants of the home. I'll say that again, to protect the life and safety of the occupants of the home. Uh, it's, it's actually part of the oath architects take um, to protect the life safety of occupants and contractors also through their continuing education every year are reminded that their intention is to protect the life safety. So building code is designed to protect the life safety. It's not designed to make sure that your doors are square or your windows don't leak or the, or that something is installed incorrectly. Inspectors are not there to inspect the quality of the work. They're there to inspect 
that everything was put together in the way International Building Code dictates. Uh, the building code is adapted and modified about every three years. We're on a three-year um, permit schedule or, or, or code um, cycle. cycle. So, what's that? Cycle. Cycle. So every three years, uh, a bunch of engineers, architects, and business people get together and decide um, what parts of the code need to be modified and, and which ones um, are, are good. Sometimes they take things out. Most of the time they add things. Um, but it protects the life safety. That includes fire protection, electrical um, protection, plumbing protection, structural protection, um, the basic needs of keeping Mother Nature out of your house, the building envelope. We refer to that in another um, episode. But building the, uh, the building code is designed to protect you. And the only way to make sure that the building code is being used is if you as the homeowner get a permit. If you don't get a permit, shame on you. It's before I turn this over to John for his commentary, I will say that as an architect and a general contractor, one of the, the things that, um, that I, I actually made a lot of money with was people calling me and saying, I got caught. I started a project without a building permit and they shut me down and now I need a building permit. Well, guess what? If you want to go get a permit post haste, in other words, after you've built the, the structure, you have to do demolition to that structure so that the building inspectors can come in and inspect what they would have normally inspected without all the stuff in the way. For instance, electrical, electrical inspector needs to make sure that your boxes and your switches are all installed correctly and grounded correctly and that you're using the right wire and, that, and the wires are terminated. Well, they can't see that. With, electric, with the drywall up and your switches all in nice little places. So you'll have to do demolition to pull it off, to see that and call the inspections. If there's a structural issue, you may have to do demolition to, to make sure that um, they can see what was built. So that's a major pain in the ass. You know, going back to um, uh, why do you hire an architect? Uh, an architect is going to require you to get a building permit. Architects cannot seal drawings that are not that uh, for projects that should have a permit that don't so that's a, a level of, of care that's built in there and finally um, before i get off my my uh, soapbox here um, when you go to sell that house in the future let's say you put on a mother-in-law addition with a kitchen a small kitchen a bathroom and a bedroom um, a real estate agent will compare the floor plans that are in this in the system because uh, the, ta the tax collectors will, will document your house and there's basic footprints of your floor plan in the system and if they go to sell the house and realize that the floor plan in the system doesn't match what's actually built they have to disclose that as part of the disclosure documents and your closing documents and if there wasn't a building permit called pulled for that work you as the seller have to go get a permit otherwise um, you're either going to be you're either going to take responsibility for it or you're going to ask your homeowner or your buyer to take responsibility for it and that usually means money coming out of your pocket so that's generally where the wh wh when it happens when i get called and they say hey uh you know we want to sell the house but you know the the garage edition we did 15 years ago we hired a chuck in the truck or dan a van he came in built it um, it may or may not be on our property line it may or may not be connected to the right utilities uh, you know, there's a myriad of things that could have gone wrong with that. But if you had just simply pulled the permit and had it inspected, you could have avoided all that. Okay, I'm done, John. You can go from there. The only thing that I'm going to add to that, because that was pretty thorough in itself, and you stole some of my thunder, <laughs> is I want to I want to talk about another short scenario here. Say you have a 20 year old house. Your deck has become decrepit, and you need to replace it. And when I say replacement, I'm not, not talking about just changing the deck boards. I'm talking about tearing down the entire thing down to the footers and starting from scratch. If you hire a deck contractor who does not pull a permit or you do not pull a permit if you're allowed to in your jurisdiction and you put that deck up, whether it meets code or not, there are a lot of jurisdictions that will tell you to tear that deck down. And if you're in a position where you're in the midst of selling your house, 
and all of a sudden it's decided through these disclosures that you don't you didn't have a permit pulled when that new deck was installed you're demolish uh, demolishing that deck and you're building a new one before that uh, closing can actually occur so you could be in you know you could be in for 20 to 40 to 50 60 thousand dollars just by virtue of you not wanting to spend four hundred dollars on a building permit yep and decks so that's don't how ridiculous it is and decks don't require drawings it's usually just a paper permit you go down to the it, it really is you can usually in like for instance in our particular county a homeowner can go down there tomorrow morning to the planning uh division in uh our county and write uh fill in some paperwork and they walk out with a permit yep and, and inspections ensue um so, you I, I know, it's extremely important as in, in most cases, the cost that you're going to spend and the time that you're going to be spending and pulling them is minuscule compared to the actual uh, problems that you could uh, run into on the back end. Uh, all of that to, to just say that building permits are not another form of government outreach, overreach, and they do serve a purpose. And um, rewatch this video several times. If you have any questions, comments in the comments below. Go to our website, send us an email. Um, John and I will be more than happy to talk to you offline uh, if you have any questions or concerns about project you have. Um, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, come back and talk about the final five of the top 15 myths. But if you're not going to join us for that next episode, please uh, subscribe to our page, our channel, like our podcast. Again, um, share this information with family and friends on your socials. Uh, hopefully we're providing a value to here that you appreciate and we're just trying to get out in front of as many people as possible um, in order to share our hard knocks our school of hard knocks that john and i have so dutifully learned from so uh until next time have a good evening and peace finishing up home projects house masters with top 15 home improvement myths Part three, numbers five to one. Welcome back to House Masters, presented by Home Projects. I'm still Steve, and John is still here, and we are still talking about the top 15 home improvement myths. And we're getting ready to talk about number 10 through number six, ratcheting up the excitement as we work towards number one. As always, we ask you to subscribe to our channel, like our videos, share with your friends. If you, see what, if you like what you're seeing, please share us on social media. More importantly, if you have any questions or comments or any ideas for future myths, please put them in the comments or visit our website and send us an email. It's supposed to be an organic discussion and we hope that you participate. So John, number 10, is this where I get to talk? Uh, we, we know that you're going to, <laughs> um, but, but before you do, do these, does this series of episodes somehow make you feel like Casey Kasem? <laughs> yeah like i'm counting down the top 15 songs in america or something yeah, like, like every saturday morning yeah you listen and you, and you record it so you have your favorite songs on a on a, on a yeah. recorded tape i uh, it almost makes me want to do a um you know a, a, what was it? you have those people call in or email and and they wanted to dedicate a song well, you i wanna... almost want to dedicate one of these particular uh myths to you and well, I, think, I mean it's a perfect time for it i, I was going to so say yeah we'll i dedicate I, this one to you i think number 10 is probably a perfect one to dedicate to me why don't you go ahead and read it so there's no bias here and then i'll i'll just take over from there all right well i can do that for you um if i could even find it um <laughs> architects and interior designers are a complete waste of money <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed so, that we. So now is the time that you must justify and redeem yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. We even have this on the list. I guess, I guess I'm happy that we're in the top third of the of the least surprising. Well, technically speaking, you're actually in the bottom half. Because, oh, uh, you'd have to be actually towards the bottom of this list. Okay, uh, six. So, uh, arch so architects and interiors designers are a waste of money. So, um, obviously, I'm an architect. Um, I'm a licensed architect, state of North Carolina, have been for going on 15 years. <clears throat> and when I was in practice, I specialized in uh, high-end residential, um, 
adapt historic uh, adaptive reuse and some commercial work. Um, and I competed with in my market in North Carolina, you're not required to be a licensed architect to do residential design. So in our market here in North Carolina, I competed with um, unlicensed draftsmen and designers who had every right to be in the market. Um, I can't say that they weren't good at what they did. A lot of them were very talented, but they're just, um, they had uh, a lower standard of ethical responsibility um, they did not carry insurance, um, errors and emissions insurance. They certainly didn't have the overhead I do when it comes to uh, maintaining my license, continuing education, um, the professional organizations that I belong to, like the American Institute of Architect and NCARB, um, which are all organizations that manage my license. And, I'm, and I say me, I'm talking me a lot here. That also goes for licensed interior designers. Uh, engineers, um, physical engineers, PEs, civil engineers, landscape architects, anybody who has a degree and extensive amount of um, expertise in an industry um, brings a lot of value to the project. Now our fees are always going to be a little bit higher compared to unlicensed designers and for all the reasons I just rattled off. But um, let's also take a step back here just from the the the, the, co the pure cost of the architect or the interior designer let's talk more about the design process in general um, I'll, I'll sit here and I'll admit that there are a lot of residential designers or or uh, or uh, non-licensed designers out there who do a good job and really the point here is that as a homeowner or contractors if you're in design build hiring a professional designer um, is never a waste of money. We we're talking earlier about moving the wall over 18 inches um, and how that um, you know costs money. Well, um, in my practice, I use a lot of 3D modeling um, uh, that allows you to see the space in as close to real time as possible. And the software I've been using has evolved over time. We can put um, you know VR glasses on now and stand in a room. Um, those types of tools are um, are very valuable. Um, they are expensive, but they bring a great value to the project for allowing you to see those spaces and being able to put furniture in a room, see how the sunlight comes through a window um, and, and, and model those types of things. And, and the other thing that's not, I, I don't know, John is, I think we actually do, we do get around to talking about building co or, or permits here eventually, but um, usually if you have a licensed architect and interior designer, you're gonna have high quality drawings um, that can be part of the deliverable into your project. In one of our previous episodes where we talk about contracts, we talk about the quality of deliverables and what the quality of deliverables does for the quality of the bid or the contract that your contractor comes to you with. And so um, if you are doing a significant project, if you're doing a, a, you know, anything um, that revol involves moving walls, um, changing mechanical systems, changing lighting, um, that deserves professional design um, and uh, it doesn't deserve a contractor sketching stuff out on a napkin and saying what do you think of this it deserves it deserves you as the homeowner sitting down with somebody and going through the design process making mistakes on paper i always tell people that you know that erasing a line in the computer is free um, erasing a line in the field cost you money that's where that wall gets moved over 18 inches so if you can make those mistakes in a computer you're gonna be far better off for it and of course we're kind of I'm, the, the the insinuation here is that we're talking about smaller projects but um the bigger the project gets when you start getting into additions and significant renovations and new home construction or additions you know um tying into existing structures tying into existing systems making sure that um, site work is correct you don't introduce um, uh, you know, stormwater issues or, or grading problems outside. Your roof lines don't conflict with each other. John, you, you and I have worked on a couple projects where the roof lines were just like you know, missing, in, <laughs> missing in the middle of the night and it took a hat trick to figure them out. Um, and uh, you, know, you just need somebody who knows what they're looking at and can envision the space. So um, it is a myth. Architects, interior designers, any professional designer is not a waste of money. They bring a lot of value to the table. And, um, and that's really what um, having professionals in the project are all about.
And real quick, you know, going back to the um, scenario that we talked about in the last uh, episode in regards to moving the wall to 18 inches and the cost that that included, you, you take on a remodel, say, and I, you know, I'm not just going to pinpoint a certain size remodel, but say your your fee for being an architect on a project is $10,000. Uh -huh. And a professional designer's price for being on that project is five. Well, that five thousand and then some is saved just by virtue of going with the architect versus the designer when it comes to a minor change like changing a wall in a remodel. So take that into account. You're going to end up paying it now or you're going to pay it later. Yeah. Better off that you pay it up front and get all of those things out in the open proactively so you don't have those issues on the job site during the process. But um, do you have anything else to add? Well, yeah, you actually brought something out that I do want to talk about. We, yeah, I one thought of, we were clear. In one of our previous episodes, we talked about contracts again. We referenced, we're referencing that episode a lot here. Um, and we talked about the design build process. And I think uh, if and when you're looking for an architect or interior designer, um, t consider hiring somebody who has some construction expertise. Um, you know, I'm a contractor as well, licensed contractor. There's not a lot of, of Steve Johnsons in the world that do architecture and construction, but you don't have to be a general contractor to understand how things go together. Uh, experience is, is valid. So hire somebody who knows the difference between a two by four and a two by six and the difference between nominal and a actual measurement. and uh, you know, uh, understands what makeup air is and, and indoor air quality and isn't just putting lines on paper or making things look pretty. So um, that's just a little plug for the professional designers all, all out there. So um, we were talking a lot about value of architects. So that kind of leads us into number nine on our list. Um, and that is my home improvement project just added value to my home. And when I just thought that we were never going to get here, here we are. We're going to talk about it. Um, everybody, I, I was sitting there watching a commercial today for a uh, well-known window manufacturer who is just pounding the air right now because um, it's window season. Yep. Um, first thing they say in their commercial is about how their windows add value to the house it adds value or it actually lessens the value of your bank account that's what it does first of all. second of all um remodeling magazine i think it is every year has what they call a cost of value report and what that means is the cost of a project versus the value that you that you gain from having that particular project done in your home and there's not a project on the list that is a one-for-one -one proposition in fact your most return is roughly about 82 83 percent and that changes from project uh, comparing on t trends on a yearly basis, uh, you know, windows, I mean, it's down in the 55% range. Yep. So every dollar that you spend on a window project, you're getting back roughly 55%. Okay. You have projects out there that will actually devalue your home. Yeah. A pool. Uh, a pool is a prime example. I mean, especially in above ground. But if you put an in-ground pool in certain jurisdictions, you know, the appraisers in that jurisdiction might look at that pool as being a liability. Homeowners, when you when you put the house up for sale, a lot of times will look at a pool as not only a liability uh, from, you know, a standpoint of safety, but also a liability from the standpoint of cost mm -hmm. in terms of maintaining that pool. It's expensive to maintain a pool. Um, so don't don't live by this mantra that everything that you're going to do to the house automatically your house value just went up five grand because you did it that's not the case at all in fact we'll talk just speaking windows again real quick because they're really easy to talk about 
you know, in most cases, for one, the real estate agent, when they're selling a house, you're not going to re realize the value of your home until you actually sell the house. Okay. You're going to pay on it through pay through your taxes, you know, every year or however your, uh, however your jurisdiction is set up when it comes to property taxes. But you're not going to realize the true value on your house or the, uh, the depreciation, uh, the appreciation of that house until you sell it or the depreciation in, in some particular markets. Yep. Um, there's some appraisers that don't account for vinyl windows versus wood windows. Um, there's not a true model out there that's a set standard. I mean, there's standards out there, but there's a lot of wiggle room around those standards. And the real estate agent, damn sure ain't going to talk about vinyl windows versus the wood no. or vinyl clad versus a vinyl, uh, vinyl window. They don't talk about those types of things. They just so, say they have, it has new windows is all you get out of it. Yes. And new windows doesn't add any particular set value to a house on the appraisal sheet. So, you know, just keep all these things in mind um, when you're doing this. Don't do it from a value standpoint. Do it from a need standpoint within the house and the utility of how your house works. Or, you know, if you got some money laying around and you want the extra convenience and you want that, you know, um, that garden tub. You know, go ahead and put it in. Um, but don't think that you're going to uh, get an extra two grand right. of value because you put a garden tub in your master bathroom. You need to do it for you. Um, I tell yep. people, I tell clients all the time, design the house for you. Um, when I hear them start talking about what's the best design decision for resale, you know, what does the next owner think about it? I'm like, uh, no, that's that's the that's the wrong reason to be thinking about this. Um, if you're if you're designing for the future for someone you don't even know yet, um, you're basically designing a spec home. So design for you, design what you like. Be aware of fads. Um, Ninety nine percent of interior design decisions made in kitchen flips and bathroom flips are based on current fads and current trends. Um, uh, the average uh, homeowner who owns their house for thirty years will renovate it twice. Um, and they're usually focusing on kitchens and bathrooms. Um, and it's usually based around um, significant point, uh, changes in their lifestyle, um, uh, kids growing up, leaving for college, or, 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 and or having, uh, having new, ch new children brought into the home. And so it's more driven by function, not uh, aesthetic. Um, I will also take this time to say that there is one thing you can do to a house that will actually add value to it. And that's actually adding on to the house. If you're physically adding square footage to the home, tangible square footage, that square footage has a value. Um, you know, in some markets, it might be $150 a square foot or $200 a square foot. Um, and so when you go to appraise your house um, for the next tax season, um, the tax collectors will say, okay, you added 100 square feet to your house, it's worth $200 a square foot. So now we're going to add the value of your home and you get to pay taxes on it. But um, that also uh, will account for when you go to resell the house, your house is being larger. Um, uh, and, and just before we move on to the next one, um, I will say that be careful about buying home renovations and additions by the square foot. If you're, do, if you're, if you're pricing a renovation or an addition by the square foot, you are not adding value to your house. Um, the only only projects that should really be priced by square foot is, is a new home construction. And even then, that's sketchy. That's, John, that's probably an episode, a whole episode unto itself. Um, anything you'd like to say before we move on to your favorite one here, number eight? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No. This is one. This is a fun one. Oh, uh, yeah. So number eight. HOAs and ARCs are always the spawn of the devil. Always the spawn of the devil. Um, well, speaking from the perspective of two former presidents of the same HOA. <laughs> yes, we believe that or not, people. John and I have been the have been the president of the same HOA for the same neighborhood. For the same neighborhood, and not obviously at the same time, but yes, we've had the pleasure of working with the same developer. Yeah. Um, 
HOAs and ARCs, they have terrible names <laughs> or terrible reputations. And for some reason, I mean, you know, for in some actual occasions, rightfully so. Um, I've lived in neighborhoods before where, you know, the president of the HOA is, you know, the spawn of Benito Mussolini. Um, they're totalitarian. They are, uh, they're power hungry. They're, you know, everything that they should not be. But there are HOAs and ARCs out there. And our, what an ARC is, if we didn't list it, is an architectural review committee. Yeah, it's usually yeah. a part of the HOA. Yes. Um, there are HOAs out there that do it the right way, that are working in the true spirit of what an HOA is supposed to be, which is keep the value of the neighborhood up to par. Correct. Protect your investment. Protect the investment of the actual members of that HOA. Um, obviously, you have issues with developers and you have issues with, you know, certain homeowners. And, you know, this homeowner likes to keep six cars on ramps in the middle of this grass. And, you know, um, they're just flamingos. a royal pain in the rear end to work with. What was that? Pink flamingos. Yeah, pink flamingos. Um you got a number of different uh, scenarios out there that an HOA will run into. Um, I was on Nextdoor last night, and somebody had posted, I don't know if you saw this, Steve, somebody in their neighborhood, the, the HOA president was driving down the street in a white sedan slowly. <laughs> okay? Well, the lady didn't know it was the HOA president at the time, but being that crime is at an all time high right now, um, she instantly looked at it as why is that car driving two miles per hour on idle down the street, you know, checking out all the houses. Well, what it turned out was she chased down the car and it happened to be the HOA president and he was checking on um, violations in the neighborhood. That's not the spirit of what I no ran my HOA. You don't go hunting for them. No. Um, that's the type of HOA that you want to get away from. And that's the type of HOA that it gives the good ones a bad name. Correct. If your HOA is meeting monthly or quarterly and inviting you know the members to come and discuss certain issues, whether it be neighborhood watch issues from a safety standpoint, whether it be you know, questions in regards to projects that they have coming up, whether it might be, you know, or do we want to add uh, certain social aspects to uh, the clubhouse, you know, so we can start breeding some camaraderie in the neighborhood. Those are the things that a HOA are meant to do. And there are a lot of them out there that actually do those things and they do them very well. Um, you know, it's, but, you know, <laughs> It, it, the the problem with a lot of them is that the people that are on the HOA boards have never once had an ounce of power or authority in their life. And now they've got it. It's an unpaid uh, position. They were elected there. So it, in <laughs> some sense, it's a po you know, it's a politician type position or a popularity popularity contest. contest. Yeah. Or in some um, cases, whoever, the, the only person who volunteers gets the job. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there's a number of different dynamics and you have to, if you're moving into a neighborhood, uh, it, you would be extremely wise to drive down the street on idle <laughs> one day on a Saturday and just pull off on the side of the road and talk to a number of neighbors to see what their HOA is like if they're actually in one. Yeah. And they'll tell you. I mean, I'm telling you, a homeowner that doesn't like their HOA, they'll man, let you know. Shout at the at the top of their lungs about how they hate them. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, in terms of arcs, real quick, that arc is the uh, only thing that saves you from uh, somebody having a yellow door uh, on a uh, tan house. So, um, 
and, and the value of the ark only comes from how strict the covenants are in terms of what they allow on a house or in a yard not necessarily how strict but how detailed they are so in other words fences um i was called by somebody on the president board in our neighborhood when i was in the airport a couple of weeks ago and she said hey you know what do you think about split rails i said well i think they're nice i mean i've had a split rail in my yard before well, I'm, I'm, if somebody's wanting one in the back of the neighborhood, you know, should we allow it? It's like, for one, I'm not on the board anymore. That's the decision you need to make. And I said, furthermore, I said, it's not in the covenants. Right. There's nothing in the covenants about a split rail fence. Good or bad. Good or bad. Yeah. So what I'm saying is the value of the ark is actually having something in the covenants about a split rail fence. Teeth. Yay or nay, whether you're going to allow it or not. And, that's the, and it could be good or bad. You know, I don't know. That comes down to opinion. But but that's also the value of actually getting on the board or getting on the arc yourself and having some actual control over those actual decisions. You can't sit back, not participate in any of this stuff, never go to the meetings or anything and sit back in the back bitching and complaining all the time. So, and there's a lot of that goes there's on. There's a lot too. of that going on, yeah. Um, but all in all, you know, HOAs can be a good thing if they're in the right spirit. Yeah. But they can also be your biggest nightmare. In, in the neighborhood I live in now, um, John and I no longer live in the same neighborhood, so we can't we can't be on the same board now anymore. Yeah, but, um, but I drove him away. <laughs> uh, in my neighborhood, we have a couple stormwater devices, uh, ponds um, for the layman, and, uh, and we have privately owned roads and um, street lighting, as well as sidewalks. And so all of those entities are managed by our HOA. Um, a good chunk of our annual dues go towards the maintenance of those devices. And we also have a professional management company that our board has hired to manage those things. So although we have, uh, we have a lot of really smart people in our neighborhood, a lot of engineers uh, and business people in my neighborhood. So there's a lot of talent on our board and that talent suggested, hey, we should have a professional management company and and we do and they're responsible for the day-to-day the -day operations of of managing those entities but more importantly they're also responsible for um managing uh uh you know issues between homeowners um if if someone does violate uh the arc or a covenant in a neighborhood you know barking dogs or um you know cars that shouldn't be where they are or crime or something um, sometimes that 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 can be a tricky situation, an adversarial situation between two homeowners, and the board and a board member can call in the management and say, "Hey, we need you to 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 na navigate this for us," and that that brings a lot of value. So, um, anything you want to add before we move on to number seven, which is also another no. big one, that I'm going to take offense to. <laughs> no, I, I, there's partial offense that I take to it. <laughs> So uh, without more further ado, so number seven on our list is um, a contractor will always screw you. Now, the reason why I said I partially take offense is the fact that I, could, I voluntarily stepped away from actually being a contractor. So um, as did I. Know, I, I, I got it out of my blood. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're still in the... Uh, in the fray, Steve. I am. Um, so there are a lot of very good professional contractors out there that are in business for the right reasons. They employ good people that work for them. I had some of the best employees. I had, you know, for a construction business like I ran, I had no turnover. You know, when I hired somebody, I was extremely picky with who I hired. I interviewed probably to a fault to get the right person, and I paid well. And, I, I mean, at one time, I didn't have anybody on my entire construction crew in the field that had that were with me less than three years. That's unheard of. That's, all, that's incredible, yeah. Especially uh, in this market. In the trades. I mean, I mean, we talked in a previous episode about, you know, a lot of, in this business, man, I mean, a lot of 
guys, especially the, the uh, low end of the totem pole laborers, you pay them on Friday and they don't show up on Monday. Yep. You know, so if you're if you're doing things the right way and for the right reasons, you know, your employees will pay you back with loyalty. And that's going to only provide an ultimate top notch service to the homeowner that you're trying to serve. There's a lot of contractors out there that that meet every or they check every box in terms of what it means to be professional, what it means to follow up, what it means to communicate, what it means to, you know, build a sound, professional and moral business. But you have a large element in this industry also that because and I'm going to say this and I know I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, I'm constantly in trouble for my mouth, but they, they're not educated. You're dealing with some of the, and when I, when I'm, when I say this, I'm speaking in terms of percentages now. Okay. A large percentage of the construction industry, you're dealing with the lowest of the doldrums when it comes to a value of a person. You're dealing with your alcoholics, your drug addicts, your, your, you know, your wife beaters, your, you know, uh, husband beaters, your being, you know, everything that you don't want to be, you're dealing with on a job site. And I'm telling you, man, I mean, <laughs> I, I, there were some people that I had as subcontractors, man. It's like, you know, I don't know if I want that guy in the house. Now, granted, he was a subcontractor. I didn't have but so much control over that. But just by virtue of the way he looked, mm -hmm. didn't provide the professionality that I was actually seeking uh, or what I was trying to offer my homeowner. Um, but yeah, you've got some real jack legs out there that, you know, they don't have the skill set, they don't have the education, um, they have a very uh, difficult time um, getting along with society in terms of how to navigate a uh, level of communication with a homeowner. Um, you know, uh, you, you got to be careful, but, you know, as with anything, uh, you know, it's anytime a sentence says will always or will never, it's usually false. Correct. Okay. Because there's always going to be elements on both sides of the fence. Um, I would venture to say that uh, there's a good 30 to 35 percent of contractors out there that are wholesome, good, moral people, and they're in it for the right reasons. And I would venture to say, Steve, that you agree with me. I would. Um, you know, there's a there's a joke on the street that 99 percent of contractors make the other one percent look bad. Um, so uh, yeah, um, and where I'm going to go with my comment here is. Don't hire a contractor only on price. Um, if you're worried about being taken advantage of, make sure you're hiring someone you trust and have a relationship with. And of course, you can still get, you can still make a mistake and hire the wrong person, even though you like them or trust them. But um, if you if you have a relationship with them, then um, that will go a long way. And you know, my, we have a running joke in our house that you know always bring someone into the house and see how the dogs react around them. Um, if the dogs don't like them, then kick them out. You know, um, that's there's a lot of truth. To a that. lot of truth. To that. A lot of truth to that. If if you know if 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 you don't if you get the the willies around somebody if they if they if they apparently don't have similar lifestyles and um, ethics and and uh, and uh, uh, you know a perception of, of how they present themselves as you do, then you're probably not going to get along with them very well. Um, you know, I wouldn't say don't hire somebody if you're a Ford guy. Don't not hire them because they're driving a Dodge, but if they show up and they're and and they, as you mentioned before, there's alcohol or or other issues with them, you'll know that real quick. Um, and the fact that they even showed up to your house in that condition is, is a clue right there. Um, now, obviously, as as the bigger the projects get, the more sophisticated and professional the contractors are. They're responding to your your request for work you're going to work your way out of that. But, um, 
you know, there's there's a lot of unlicensed trades out there that have all the characteristics that John just described. So again, we've done a couple episodes already about contracts um, that talk a lot about how to weed these out. Um, and we've also talked about, um, uh, you know, the ethics of how to hire people. So um, a contractor won't always screw you, but it is possible to get screwed by a contractor. How about that? There are professional contractors that they're not going to intentionally screw you, but you at the end of the project might deem that you got screwed by them. That's correct. Yep. Just by virtue of a misunderstanding. Yep. Absolutely. And that's kind of, that that's probably kind happens of more often than not. Why we're doing what we're doing as in this podcast that we do, you know, with home projects is the fact that we're trying to create understanding of each other from both sides of the table. And there, there's been a major disconnect over the past decades in this industry. I mean, major, major disconnect. And we realize it. I mean, heck, we, we, we lived it. Um, you know, you don't live it so much, Steve, because you're more on the commercial side now. But in the residential side, man, yeah. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a match of egos. Of course. You know? And, um, you know, it's it, it, this homeowner's brace. I mean, they, they hate you before you even knock on the door if you're a contractor. Just by virtue of this particular myth right here that we're talking about. Yeah. Because they've been conditioned to think that, man, this guy, when he comes in this house, he's going to screw me to high heaven. Yep. And that's just not the case. You just need to do your due diligence, do your homework, research, watch these these podcasts that we're talking about that we're going to navigate you through the process, and uh, you're going to be perfectly fine. But that does not mean that there's not going to be something that goes awry in the middle of the process. It happens. It's called construction. Yep. And that's another major thing that we say in the in the industry. It's construction. <laughs> something on the job is going to happen. Snafu. We promise you. Situation normal. All it's not, if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when. Yep. I will. Um, uh, yeah, all that's correct. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add to it other than the fact that, um, again, interview, interview. I always, on when I was on doing design build work and clients always asked me about interviewing contractors. They, of course, always asked me for, for referrals and I, I would make referrals to contractors I had relationships with. But um, I always told them, I said, you know, everyone asks to talk to, you know, they're asked the contractor to give them referrals. You know, let me talk to your last three clients. Well, guess what? They're going to give you the names of the clients that are happy with them. So I challenge you as a homeowner to ask them for th two clients that went terrible. And, and make sure you tell the, cl the, our, the contractor you're not going to rely on those people's um, uh, input to make your decision. But it does two or three things for you. One, it, it it will help you determine whether or not the contractor is honest and um, and confident in himself or herself to give you the name of somebody that he knows is going to say bad things about him. Two, if you get if you actually do get a chance to talk to somebody who has nothing but bad things to say, it gives you an opportunity to ask how that went sideways. Um, and it can, you can learn a lot about a contractor. Was it communication? Was it a bad contract? Um, or was it that they showed up drunk and inebriated on the job site? There's a big difference between the two. One of one you can fix, the other other you can't. Um, I'll tell you the other thing it's going to do, Steve, not to mean to step on you, yep. but it's going to show you as to whether that particular contractor has a specific level of skill set when it comes to crisis management. Correct. Yes, that was my when, third one. When the crap hits the fan. <laughs> How do they deal with it? And and we just said a minutes ago, it's going to hit the fan sooner or later. How do they deal with it? Were they calm and collective and provided solutions to get you out of the malaise that you're in? Or did it just end up just spiraling downward from the, from the point that that crap hit the fan? Yeah. Well, we beat that one to death. Yes. So, um, so number six, and the last one in this, in this series of five, uh, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to explain the intent of it, and then I'll let you, John, um, commentate on it. So, number six is, building permits are just another form of government overreach and serves no purpose. So, what we're talking about here in terms of building permits, of course, is building code. So, the intent of a permit... I'll just, I'll just lay this out. The intent of the permit 
is to make sure that you as the homeowner are being protected and making sure that your project is being built per building code. Now, building codes are intended to do one thing, to protect the life safety of the occupants of the home. I'll say that again, to protect the life and safety of the occupants of the home. Uh, it's, it's actually part of the oath architects take um, to protect the life safety of occupants and contractors also through their continuing education every year are reminded that their intention is to protect the life safety. So building code is designed to protect the life safety. It's not designed to make sure that your doors are square or your windows don't leak or, the, or that something is installed incorrectly. Inspectors are not there to inspect the quality of the work. They're there to inspect that everything was put together in the way International Building Code dictates. Uh, the building code is adapted and modified about every three years. We're on a three-year um, permit schedule or a, a codes um, cycle. cycle. So, what's that? Cycle. It's cycle. So every three years, uh, a bunch of engineers, architects, and business people get together and decide uh, what parts of the code need to be modified. And, and which ones um, are, are good. Sometimes they take things out. Most of the time they add things, um, but it protects the life safety. That includes fire protection, electrical um, protection, plumbing protection, structural protection, um, the basic needs of keeping mother nature out of your house, the building envelope. We refer to that in another um, episode, but building the, uh, the building code is designed to protect you. And the only way to make sure that the building codes being used is if you as the homeowner get a permit. If you don't get a permit, shame on you. It's before I turn this over to John for his commentary, I will say that as an architect and a general contractor, one of the, the things that, um, that I, I actually made a lot of money with was people calling me and saying, I got caught. I started a project without a building permit and they shut me down. And now I need a building permit. Well, guess what? If you want to go get a permit post haste, in other words, after you've built the, the structure, you have to do demolition to that structure so that the building inspectors can come in and inspect what they would have normally inspected without all the stuff in the way. For instance, electrical, electrical inspector needs to make sure that your boxes and your switches are all installed correctly and grounded correctly and that you're using the right wire and the, and the wires are terminated. Well, they can't see that with electric, with the drywall up and your switches all in nice little places. So you'll have to do demolition to pull it off, to see that and call the inspections. If there's a structural issue, you may have to do demolition to, to make sure that um, they can see what was built. So that's a major pain in the ass. You know, going back to um, uh, why do you hire an architect? Uh, an architect is going to require you to get a building permit. Architects cannot seal drawings that are not that uh, for projects that should have a permit that don't. So that's a, a level of, of care that's built in there. And finally, um, before I get off my, my uh, soapbox here, um, when you go to sell that house in the future, let's say you put on a mother-in-law addition with a kitchen, a small kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. Um, a real estate agent will compare the floor plans that are in this in the system because uh, the, ta the tax collectors will, will document your house and there's basic footprints of your floor plan in the system and if they go to sell the house and realize that the floor plan in the system doesn't match what's actually built they have to disclose that as part of the disclosure documents and your closing documents and if there wasn't a building permit called pulled for that work you as the seller have to go get a permit. Otherwise, um, you're either going to be re you're either going to take responsibility for it, or you're going to ask your homeowner or your buyer to take responsibility for it. And that usually means money coming out of your pocket. So that's generally where the wh wh when it happens when I get called and they say, hey, uh, you know, we want to sell the house, but you know the the garage addition we did 15 years ago, we hired a truck in the truck or Dan a van, he came in built it. Um, it may or may not be on our property line. It may or may not be connected to the right utilities. Uh, you know, all, there's a myriad of things that could have gone wrong with that. But if you had just simply pulled the permit and had it inspected, you could have avoided all that. Okay, I'm done, John. You can go from there. 
The only thing that I'm going to add to that, because I was pretty thorough in itself, and you stole some of my thunder, <laughs> is I want to I want to talk about another short scenario here. Say you have a 20 year old house. Your deck has become decrepit, and you need to replace it. And when I say replacement, I'm not, not talking about just changing the deck boards. I'm talking about tearing down the entire thing down to the footers and starting from scratch. If you hire a deck contractor who does not pull a permit or you do not pull a permit if you're allowed to in your jurisdiction and you put that deck up, whether it meets code or not, there are a lot of jurisdictions that will tell you to tear that deck down. And if you're in a position where you're in the midst of selling your house and all of a sudden it's decided through these disclosures that you don't you didn't have a permit pulled when that new deck was installed you're demolish, uh, demolishing that deck and you're building a new one before that uh, closing can actually occur so you could be in you know you could be in for 20 to 40 to 50 60 thousand dollars just by virtue of you not wanting to spend four hundred dollars on a building permit. Yep, and decks. So that's don't how require, ridiculous it is. And decks don't require drawings. It's usually just a paper permit. You go down to the. It, it really is. You can usually, and like for instance, in our particular county, a homeowner can go down there tomorrow morning to the planning uh, division in uh, our county and write, uh, fill in some paperwork, and they walk out with a permit. Yep, and, and inspections ensue. Um, so, you I, I know, it's extremely important as in, in most cases, the cost that you're going to spend and the time that you're going to be spending and pulling them is minuscule compared to the actual uh, problems that you could uh, run into on the back end. Uh, all of that to, to just say that building permits are not another form of government outreach, overreach, and they do serve a purpose. And um, rewatch this video several times. If you have any questions, comments in the comments below. Go to our website, send us an email. Um, John and I will be more than happy to talk to you offline uh, if you have any questions or concerns about project you have. Um, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, come back and talk about the final five of the top 15 myths. But if you're not going to join us for that next episode, please uh, subscribe to our page, our channel, like our podcast. Again, um, share this information with family and friends on your socials. Uh, hopefully we're providing a value to you here that you appreciate and we're just trying to get out in front of as many people as possible um, in order to share our hard knocks our school of hard knocks that john and i have so dutifully learned from so uh until next time have a good evening and peace don't forget to like our video and subscribe leave a comment or question while you're at it your support is very important Visit www.homeprojects.com to donate via PayPal or GoFundMe. Thank you.